It really is an honor to be here. Um, when I was asked to give the talk about the ABCs of spasmodic dysphonia, I really thought, what could I say to you all in this room in 15 minutes that you don't know? Um, <clears throat> I, 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 I've been doing this for 22 or 23 years now. I think my first injections were done in October 1992, and I remember participating in one of the NSDA meetings in Nashville, Tennessee, under the pushing of Ed Stone at the time. And uh, it really has been an interesting journey. But I look around and there's people who've had the disease for longer than I've been treating it, and people who've been treating the disease for nearly as long as I've been born. So, um, sorry, Herb. Um, <laughs> but so, so what can I tell you all about the ABCs of SD? Really, I just, I'm gonna keep it very simple. Uh, it's a laryngeal dystonia, a voice disorder characterized by involuntary movements of the, or spasms of one or more of the muscles of the larynx and the vocal folds. And it seems inconceivable to me that people could have ever really considered this a psychogenic disorder. There are too many people presenting with too similar symptoms and uh, too, too, ma too many complications. So, but what are the effects of spasmodic dysphonia? There's really a reduction in voice-related quality of life. One of the reasons I got into trying to identify that and study that is because one of my early mentors said, Mark, voice is not a life and death matter. And I disagreed because that's why I'm into it. And so I wanted to show that patients with voice disorders certainly reported not only reductions in voice-related quality of life, but reductions in uh, reports of general health as well. And so patients with impairments, neurologic impairments, and specifically spasmodic disease <clears throat> report reductions in social functioning and mental health when the disease is left untreated. That led to look at another area. And the area was, what do you all feel about your voice and how do we perceive it? So another project we undertook was to look to see if patients reporting a vocal impairment correlated with expert clinician rating of vocal impairment. Because moving to the Bay Area where it's expensive to live, patients would often come in and say, well, this is only mild SD. I've been told this is mild, a mild problem. I feel guilty about seeking treatment for it. And what I found out was that your perceptions of the severity of the d disease in your life didn't at all correlate with our perceptions of how severely your voice was disordered. In other words, some patients with SD are able to compensate, if that's the correct term, for the disorder and present themselves with a fairly normal voice. That doesn't mean they're not working. And so self-rated perceptions of the disease severity don't correlate. So one point I'd like to make is that never feel guilty about seeking treatment or never seek treatment because some clinician told you it was only a mild disorder. And we have shown that treatment of spasmodic dysphonia does improve voice-related quality of life as well as normalizing measures of social functioning and mental health. You're not crazy. <laughs> I like showing this picture because this was taken year, years ago, decades now, um, with some of my team members, Cheryl Belanti and Dave Zeeler here, and uh, a former patient, uh, I think it was before HIPAA, I should have probably blocked out the eyes, a speech pathologist with SD. And, you know, <clears throat> I guess the disease was first described by Traub in 1871 as a nervous hoarseness or a spastic dysphonia, and Critchley uh, characterized the, 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 the initial descriptions of sounding like somebody's talking while they're being choked, and uh, it was likened to stuttering. All in all, still considered to be a psychogenic disease by many people. I think there was a big leap forward in 1968 with Arison. Aronson describing two subtypes of the disease, the adductor or strain strangled hoarseness and the abductor. And really, that was a simplification of the process because if we think of this from a neurological standpoint, why would only the adductors, the abductors be affected? We can't separate those areas in the brain. We can't separate whether it's the adductory muscle or the abductory muscle. So how could the disease process separate that. So I think what we really see is a spectrum disorder of a laryngeal dystonia that involves all of the muscles to varying degrees. And we as clinicians hear primarily adductory events or abductory events, so we treat primarily abductory or adductory events. But this is not a new concept. This was advanced in 1981 by Canedo and Johnson, really 
talking about SD as a continuum or spectrum disorder. The etiology of SD remains unknown. There is increasing evidence of a neurogenic origin involving the brain and nerves, and this indicates that the primary problem is not with the larynx. It's a form of dystonia, and it's sim similar to other forms of focal dystonia that are task-specific. And there some, seems to be, in some epidemiologic studies, a genetic basis where families have similar uh, patterns of expression and have some similar chromosomal abnormalities. How is the diagnosis made? Still, the diagnosis is made on the basis of symptoms. It's a diagnosis of exclusion. And that's the same with many neurological diseases. You know, we, we don't have specific tests for most neurologic diseases, uh, particularly the degenerative ones. Fortunately, SD does not appear to be a degenerative one. And I think the diagnosis relies on an interdisciplinary team. Um, specifically, primarily in 2015, with an otolaryngologist and a speech-language pathologist. And I distinguish here between interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary because I find that it's most effective to treat patients in an interdisciplinary model where we see the patients together, where the speech-language pathologist and the physician can evaluate the patient at the same time in the same clinic, come to some decisions with the patient about what is going on and some decisions with each other about what are treatment options for recommendation. We often involve a multidisciplinary team, so someone who sees the patient later, a neurologist, to rule out or evaluate the patient for other systemic diseases. But um, it's not primarily, and I think the neurologists I work with constantly think I'm crazy for sending these patients because they really have nothing most of the time other than spasmodic dysphonia. Well, our treatment options, you know, voice therapy can provide methods to compensate for the disease, airflow and reduction of tension, and patients can be taught to speak with a little breathy dysphonia in terms of a manner to get around the disease. And there are speech language pathologists in certain areas of the country who really still feel that they can primarily help patients with voice therapy alone. And if patients feel satisfied with that, then that's a great way to start. And what some of the empirical data suggests is that it may actually increase the length of time between injections or help with vocal difficulties after surgery. Um, botulinum toxin injections, Botox, remain the, 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 the primary treatment uh, management option of choice for most patients today. Um, there are people who consider it um, difficult to give a patient or subject a patient to repeated nature of injections and suggest that, as we'll talk about later today, that maybe um, there are better options that would not require repeated trips to the doctor. And then there are also problems that we'll talk about later today in the panel on the good, the bad, and the ugly of Botox, over-treatment and under-treatment. How do we avoid that as best we can? And finally, a treatment option, surgery. And originally, it was one of the initial treatment options proposed by uh, some surgeons and uh, has been refined over the years to include selective laryngeal adductory denervation and renervation versus unilateral nerve section or nerve avulsion. But I'm sure we'll hear about those in the panel section on surgery. I want to try to catch us back up on time. So there's a lot of supporting evidence that spasmodic dysphonia is a neurologic disorder, and this is where I think the excitement comes in. And it co-occurs co with other neurologic movement disorders, and there's a familial inheritance pattern in a small percentage of the patients. There's histologic changes that have been identified in the recurrent laryngeal nerve, and there's functional MRI signals changes in patients with spasmodic dysphonia. Uh, so let's digress for a second. But you know. How the body, how the brain controls movement was originally worked out uh, in the 1920s by Wilder Penfield. And he did something called the Montreal Procedure for Epilepsy where he removed a small portion of the temporal lobe. And what it allowed Dr. Penfield to do was identify areas in the human brain that were responsible for sensation and motion. And we call that the human homunculus. And I, I've taken the liberty of, of putting it here over Dr. Penfield's picture. Right? But what he essentially found, and his coworkers essentially found, is that there were areas in the brain that gave rise to movement in the legs, the hand, the face, lips, tongue. 
and he has it all sequentially laid out here in the brain, and the certain areas were for motor, and certain areas were for uh, sensory. So we call that the motor cortex and the sensory cortex on the human homunculus. And, you know, Penfield and Rasmussen were, worked on the control of speech and described sequential dorsal ventral organization for the lips, jaw, tongue, and pharynx, but were unable in their early experiments to separate speech from voice. And so they sort of lumped all of speech and articulation right down here in this lowest area. And the excitement has come over the last um, decades. You know, Christy Ludlow, in a, in a, in a manuscript she wrote, studied that, stated that the central nervous system for voice is the new frontier, is the study of the central control of the laryngeal musculature for voice, swallowing and breathing, and how volitional and reflexive control symptoms may interact in humans. And she did a great job of laying out what we knew at that point in time and what was controlled, what areas of the brain controlled volitional breathing, what areas contained voice and speech production, and what areas were, were involved in volitional swallowing. And so that's a great article that I could refer you all to, but some of the researchers who have continued brain mapping have really investigated the sensory motor cortex and have been able to identify specific areas in the motor cortex and, and, and sensory motor cortex where the larynx itself is represented for the task of voicing. That's very exciting to us because <clears throat> when we think about it, if we know where voice is supposed to be produced centrally, Normally, maybe we can study that in patients with voice-related diseases to see if those central mechanisms have changed. You know, when you think about phonation, your brain has to say, I want to speak. I want to have the desire to speak. And then you have to prepare for that. So every time you go to utter a phrase, your certain portions of your brain, we call the ventral premotor cortex, estimates how the larynx should be configured to produce that sound that you want to produce, and then your motor portions of your brain place the larynx in that desired position. And so then you begin to speak, but there's a delay between the time you coordinate your lung exhalation and the time the vocal folds begin to vibrate, and we call that phonation onset. And so you have to be able to control all of that, and the brain helps with that control and organizing it. And then, while you're speaking, you have to maintain the act of phonation. And so then your brain is telling your muscles to make these constant adjustments because your brain feels where your voice is in space, your vocal folds are in space, and your brain hears what your vocal folds are producing. And so it's using those two signals to auto-adjust and to finely tune. So if we can look at all of these signals, if we can figure out where these signals occur in the central nervous system, we may be able to find out where the disorder is in the brain. And so where does the abnormal signal arise? Does it arise in the higher cortical centers that are controlling this? Does it arise in some of the feedback-related sensors, in the sensory, somatosensory cortex, or in our ability to feel where the vocal folds are, or in our ability to hear what uh, the vocal folds are producing? And so I, I, I want to stop now because I work with some brilliant researchers at UCSF who've, who've worked over the years to develop techniques to be able to allow us to separate some of those uh, input regulatory signals, and I think we're going to hear in the next section about some of this research. So the postulate is that the timing of the onset of voice in patients with voice disorders not due to structural vocal fold abnormalities may provide important information regarding the location of the aberrant signal. And if we can identify that, then we can develop targeted therapies where we may affect primarily that area that's disordered. Or if they're not targeted therapies, if we're doing behavioral therapies or some other type of end organ instrumentation, we can see if those instrumentations affect the central area if we know where to look. So I'll stop now. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you.